waiting to sow into something, here it is. Let's do it. This is the time. It's not later. It's now. And, I, I, you know, me and Nick are talking. We're saying, boy, we want to get behind this, even our, the FOTV ministries. We want to be a part of this. I'm not waiting for the next train to come in. I mean, this is as clear of a word as I've ever heard anywhere. And I, I have a little bit of understanding of what's being said out there, around, at least around the Western church. And it doesn't get any clearer than this. And this is a very, very important one. So, David, forgive me for all that, but you just have to bear with that. Lord, I thank you for your servant. Lord, we want to see this seed go forth in power and multiplication and might, that multitudes would be impacted in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, bless the hearing of your word even tonight and the speaking of it. In Jesus' name, amen. I am increasingly amazed at your stamina. (laughs) <laughs> How do you cope with all this teaching? I don't know. You won't possibly remember it all. I'm glad some of you are taking notes. My wife always takes notes when I preach. Even though she may have heard the material again and again, she still takes notes. She still hears something new from the Lord. She never looks at the notes again. <laughs> but she says, writing it down fixes it in my eye while your voice is fixing it in my ear. So she gets the message twice and it does go in. I know to my cost she has a terrible habit of remembering something I preached when it is particularly needed by me. (laughs) And I've repeatedly told her that we make a good team. If I preach Christianity and she practices it, that's a good combination. (laughs) Well now, how many of you are here tonight who were not able to be here this afternoon? Could I see? Right. And how many were here this afternoon who were not able to be here tonight? (laughs) Two, anyway. Right. Well, in a sense, it'll be a little difficult for you to, those of you who were not here this afternoon, to pick up uh, immediately what we're into because we're halfway through it. But I'd like to say that my teaching on Revelation is available in three forms, on tape, video, and in book form. In fact, it's in two books. One is called When Jesus Returns, and I was glad to see that's available here. The other is in volume eight. I've spent eight years teaching the entire Bible. It began with a group of churches in the Thames Valley in England, Their pastors got together and said, David, please come and help us. And I said, "Uh, what help do you need? They said, our people have stopped reading the Bible for themselves. They listen to Bible teachers, they, they go to meetings, but they don't study the Bible for themselves. Will you help us to help them to do it? I said, all right, I'll come for one night a month, one Sunday night a month. I'll speak for three hours. You can have coffee in the middle. I will speak each night on one book of the Bible, provided they've all read that book before I come, will promise to read it again after I've gone, and for the next month that all preachers will preach from it, and all the house groups in that month will study it and discuss it, so that by one month they have a reasonable grasp of the truth of that book. And I said, my objective will be twofold. One to get them so excited and interested in the book that they can't wait to read it, and second, to give them enough help with background information and some understanding of the structure of the book so that when they do read it, they get excited because they understand it and are really able to feed themselves from it. So they booked four nights, and I went over. And uh, the reception was very good, And they began to get into their Bibles and get excited about it. It was no longer a a medicinal way of reading the Bible. Do you know what I mean by that? Twelve verses a day keeps the devil away sort of thing, you know? (laughs) That's the medicinal use. So there's the horoscope use of the Bible. You know, you're sort of... (laughs) And hope that it fits, you know? There are all sorts of ways of reading the Bible, but God meant you to read it a book at a time. So that's what we did for four months. At the end of that little experiment, the pastors came to me and said, David, I wonder if we could book you for six years. 
And I laughed, I said I might be in heaven by then. But they did, and I did. And it took six years to go once a month and cover every book in the Bible. Now the tapes were made of that, but I was using pictures and charts like tonight. And though the tapes went far and wide, letters came, angry letters from Christians saying, we didn't see the pictures and we didn't see the maps and the charts. And so uh, Jim Harris, who distributes all my tapes in England and other countries, he said, David, you'll have to do it all again on video. So we started all over again. And we went right through the Bible book by book and made a complete set of videos called Unlocking the Bible. And I thought, well, that's over. And I relaxed. And then I had a phone call from a major publisher in London. We now want this in book form. <laughs> so we had to start all over again. And we used the soundtracks of the videos as the basis, but they had to be rewritten, of course, and corrected in various ways. And finally, last year, we finished the eight books. So it's all over. And I've taught every book of the Bible. Well, now, volume eight, which is actually the New Testament, volume three, contains all the teaching you've heard these few days and more. And that's, I see a few copies are available. Indeed, I brought a few copies. But I'm sure that we, you can get more if you need them. So if you want it in book form so that you can scribble on the book and reread it, then it is available. But you'll never remember everything I say in three days here like this because we're covering an immense amount of ground. Well, let's push on. Have you got your running shoes on? Right, then let's race ahead. This afternoon, we went through the 21 disasters in the big trouble. And I'm not going to go through them all again, but for the sake of those who were not here, here they are. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of wrath poured out on the earth. Each seven divided into four, two, and one. And the last three in each case are woes or curses of God on the world. We need to remember that God is a God who curses as well as blesses because he's a God of righteousness as well as a God of compassion and mercy. And these woes are God's curse on a world that has defied him, rebelled against him, ruined his creation, killed each other. When you realize that God has to watch everything that happens, when elderly pensioners in our country are raped by teenagers, God is present at every one of those dreadful events. I can understand why he gets angry about what we do to each other, never mind how we ignore him. And so these are curses of God. And these are human-caused disasters, natural disasters. There's a kind of acceleration and intensification as we move on through these things. And there's a speeding up. And what a relief it is to know that all this is happening in a comparatively short period. Only a matter of months, really. Well, three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days. God tells us in three different ways how long it takes for all these things to happen. It's not long, is it? But it's pretty severe. And we looked at these this afternoon. The question we didn't look at is, how do these relate to each other? Do they simply follow each other, one after another, so that there are 21 successive events? That's one theory of those who seek to interpret this section of Revelation. Now, I hope most of you can see that. I've put the seals in red, the trumpets in green, and the bowls in blue. And there are three possibilities of how they all relate to each other. The first is the simplest, which simply says they are successive. The seven seals are followed by the seven trumpets, followed by the seven bowls. Twenty-one tragedies, one after another. However, we saw when we went through those others, perhaps I'd better put it back on, that in fact... The seventh in every case is the same. It's an earthquake on a universal scale. 
an earthquake on a universal scale, an earthquake on a universal scale. So number seven in each of the series is the identical same event. And that led people to a second theory that in fact they were simultaneous. Let me uncover these bit by bit so that you get it clearer. The first idea was they are successive. The seven seals followed by the seven trumpets followed by the seven bowls. The second theory was that they are simultaneous. That the ones and the twos and threes, fours, fives, six and sevens all coincide. They happen simultaneously with each other because the seventh is clearly the same event and so people said well perhaps the other six all happen together and finish up together. Actually both these got partly right. It is a combination of the two that fits every detail perfectly and the combination is that they are both successive and simultaneous or rather that the six trumpets uh, trumpets are successive to the six seals and the six bowls are successive to the six trumpets but all look forward to that final event number seven. Now that fits the whole thing perfectly. The six seals are followed by the six trumpets by the six bowls and do you notice six six six? That familiar to you? It's not the same connection but it is implying that each of the series of six is incomplete until God completes it with that final seven which completes all three as it were. They don't happen simultaneously, the sixth, but the seventh to do. Now I hope that's clear enough for you to grasp because it really does fit and people have argued between these two ideas which are by far the most common Indeed, I've only read this one in one commentary. But as soon as I read it, when I went back and checked it in Scripture, it fitted like a glove. So uh, that's the one I believe is right. But I'm not infallible, so study it yourself if you're interested. If it seems a complicated arrangement to you, well, it is really, isn't it? It tells me one thing, that the emphasis is in, in this section is not on when each thing happens. The order is not so important or Jesus who gave the revelation would have made it even simpler and clearer. The point is these are the things that will happen which we will recognize, which we will not be troubled over but uh, we need to be ready for all these things in whatever order they come. But I believe the order is in there hidden. Now there's something else we now want to add to this. If this is the right interpretation, that it's both successive and simultaneous, then there is something else we notice. We now notice that there are sections that are interwoven with these sevens. For example, between the sixth and seventh seal, chapter seven comes in on quite a different subject. Between the 6th and 7th trumpet, chapters 10 to 11 come in. And we would expect the third interlude to occur between the 6th and the 7th bow. But those are too close. 7 immediately follows 6 there, so the section comes before the final bowls, 12 to 14. And here we have three special intervening passages which tell us what is happening to God's people during these times. The seals, trumpets and bowls tell us what's happening to the world generally. But obviously we're keen to know what's going to be happening to the two of God's people, the Jews and the Christian believers. And that's what we find out from those three interludes. And now we have the whole of section 6 to 16 laid out for us very neatly. We have six seals, an interlude, and the seventh. We have six trumpets which follow the six seals and an interlude followed by the seventh. And then we have an interlude 
and the final seven runs right into each other on. That's an outline of the chapters. So now when you read it, it does jump about a bit, but you can use that diagram to see where you're going. And I think you'll get things very much more clearly. Now those three interludes, I've given three titles to, but the ink is so faded that I'm sure you can't see it, but I'll read it out so that those of you taking notes can write it down. Interlude number one, from between the sixth and seventh seal, I have called two peoples or two groups. The second interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpet, I have called two witnesses. And the final interlude, which comes before the last series of seven bowls of wrath, I have called two beasts. And that's a neat way of just remembering the interludes. Two peoples or two groups, two witnesses, and two beasts. And that sums up those uh, intervening passages. And it's about those that I now wish to speak tonight. And it's a very important topic. God isn't just going to throw these things at our whole world and forget his people. What is he going to do with them during the time? And what pressures will come on them during these troubles? And how will they cope with them? Let's begin with the first interlude, chapter 7. It's concerned with two groups of people, the Jews and Christian believers. Or rather, some Christian believers. Let's look at those two groups in chapter 7. The Jewish group first, and there is a figure given of 144,000 composed of 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Whether we take these numbers literally or take them as figurative figures, meaning a round number or what, 12 by 12 by 1,000, I don't know. What is very clear is that these people, these Jewish people, of the 12 tribes, we say 10 of them have been lost. They haven't, not to God. He knows where every one member of the tribe. A God who has counted the hairs on my head has no difficulty keeping track of all the scattered Jews. There are still Jews from every one of the 12 tribes in our world. And it's clear that God wants a representative group of each of those tribes at the end of history. And they are preserved on earth from all that is happening. What has happened in the past history is that Jews have often been blamed for the troubles that hit the world. They've been used as scapegoats. To take just one example in the Middle Ages, something hit Europe called the Black Death, a horrible plague a bubonic plague it was, and a third of Europe's population were wiped out. It was one of the biggest disasters ever to hit Europe. Who was blamed for it? The Jews. Why were they blamed for it? Because fewer of them died. Why did fewer of them die? Because they still kept Moses' law. They kept hygienic laws of Moses. They were very careful about what they did with human excreta because that's written in the law of Moses in Deuteronomy. It says when they went to empty their bowels, they must go well outside human habitation, take a spade with them, dig a hole, and bury what they did. And they were doing that in the Middle Ages, whereas in the Middle Ages towns, the... Uh, there was no sewage, there was no disposal, the streets ran with it. No wonder Jews were more likely to survive than Gentiles. But of course, when it was noticed, they were accused of poisoning the Gentiles, of killing off millions of Gentiles in Europe. They were scapegoats. I'm afraid it becomes clear that in the big trouble, Christians will be the scapegoat. God will protect the Jews. He promised them that as long as the sun shone and the waves rolled on the seashore, he would preserve them as a nation, as a people. And God is a God who never breaks a promise. And he is doing that today, and he will do it right to the end. And so the first part of chapter 7, 
says that a represented group of Israel in which are included members of every tribe will be protected by the God of Israel, who is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. After John saw that and wrote it down, he had another vision of a, a much, much greater number. Couldn't be counted, a multitude that no man could number. And they are not on earth. They are in heaven. And an angel asks John, who do you think these are? And he says, I don't know. You know, Lord, I don't. Who are they? And the answer is, these are they who are coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood. And they are coming out of the great tribulation. Now, unfortunately, that has confirm some people in their idea that we all escape the big trouble. But let me point out very carefully, and the, the Greek here, I'm sorry to have to introduce a bit more Greek, but it was written in Greek, and what it actually says is very important. Anyone coming out of the Great Tribulation has been in it. <laughs> now, is that too obvious to say? How can you come out of something that you're not in? That's the first comment I make. They have been in it, and now they're in heaven. But the verb that is used is even more illuminating. It says they are coming out. And that verb means one by one in a long procession. They're not coming out in a whole group, whoosh. One by one, they are escaping out of the big trouble. And all the way through the book of Revelation, we are given clues as to how they're escaping. They are escaping by martyrdom. There will be more Christian martyrs in those last few years than there have been in just any century, even, any year. I told you that last year, 268,000 Christians were martyred quarter of a million in just one year, but this will reach a climax when the big trouble is on. Christians will be the scapegoat. But in a sense, this is good news for the martyrs. The whole book is written to encourage people to be willing to die for Christ when the, when the crunch comes. And so we have here a lovely encouragement. They've been in the big trouble, but one by one they're coming out of it by martyrdom, and it has a lovely, lovely statement at the end of this vision which says, and God himself is wiping all tears from their eyes, and the scorching sun will no longer touch them. They are out of it, and they're being comforted by God in heaven. It's not all Christians. It's those who, as a scapegoat and the fury of the Antichrist and the false prophet and the devil himself, are escaping by martyrdom. Death for them will be a release from the pressures they've been under, and God himself will be shepherd to them and look after them like his flock. Well, that's chapter 7, the two groups of people, and there they are. Now, chapters 10 to 11 was the next interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, and that is about two witnesses. But chapter 10 focuses us back on John. John has now released an awful lot of vision, written it down for the church to read, but now he is approaching the worst part of the big trouble the bowls of wrath. And God, to symbolize this final revelation of the last of the big trouble, gives John a little scroll to eat and digest. On it is written this last bit of the bowls of wrath, the worst bit. And John eats it in vision. And he tastes it. And it tastes sweet and sour. That's not just a Chinese dish, but actually your tongue 
has sweet and sour follicles which taste those two tastes and a good cook knows that and combines them skillfully so that you get maximum taste from a dish. That's why we have sweet and sour sauce. China discovered how to tickle every part of your taste buds. You know, I was told I was wrong in this, but I've checked up with someone else and he says I'm right, so I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. But I thought that the sweet taste was at the front of your tongue and the sour taste further back so that your whole tongue responds. Now, if that's wrong, it's wrong. But that's what I heard. But you know, when I read the book of Revelation, it tastes sweet and sour. Does it to you? There are things that get you excited and moved and you love and the taste is good. And then the next bit gives you a, a kind of sour taste. More difficult to swallow that bit. Isn't that a vivid description of this book? And John found it so. What he was hearing was both sweet and sour. It was sweet because it meant that God was dealing with evil and cleaning the world up and, and preparing the way for a brand new world. But it was sour when he thought of all the suffering and all the pain and the sadness that was going to come as well. Sweet and sour. And in chapter 10, John went through this experience. God is saying, taste this. Take it right in. Digest it. You'll find some of it good to taste and some of it not so good, but you must digest the whole of it. Then we move on to chapter 11, and then we meet these two witnesses. Right at the end, at the height of the big trouble, there will still be witnesses to God and to his truth and to his Christ. The gospel is still available to people. It would be wonderful if these troubles caused many to cry out to God and to turn to God. Sadly, we are told that they don't. We're told that people, far from turning to God, turn against him. Blame him, rather than ask why should he do this to his own world. They don't want to know. And they refuse again and again to repent. Take a disaster like 9-11, uh, as you call it, the Twin Towers of New York. It was a glorious opportunity for people to repent. As Jesus said when the Tower of Siloam fell, you will also likewise perish if you don't repent. It is a, a call of God. He allows disasters. It's a call of God to repent. And many preachers said that. Notably, David Wilkerson in New York, just down the road from where it all happened. But did America repent? No, we're getting over the shock quite well, thank you. The fear is receding. We're getting back to normal. It's fading into history already. There was a lot of fear around immediately afterwards of ABC, atomic, biological, and chemical weapons in the hands of terrorists, but I sense that fear is fading until the next time it happens. Far from leading to repentance, I don't find a great wave of repentance. There may be some individuals who have, and many have repented as the result of my tape on that disaster, but in general terms, humanity is learning to cope, is adjusting and getting back to forgetting God so easily. And that's what happens here. And repeatedly it says the gospel is still available. Witnesses are still talking about God, but they're not being listened to. Even disasters such as this don't turn people to God if they don't want to. Well, the two witnesses appear in Jerusalem, would you believe it? And presumably television will still be working, and I guess that might give them a worldwide audience. But there are two witnesses in the streets of the city of Jerusalem crying out to a world, calling to a world to remember God. Now, many people have asked me, who are they? And the answer is, I don't know. We're not told. And I never answer questions that the Bible doesn't answer. It would be pure speculation. Some people say, is it Moses and Elijah come back? I don't know. doesn't say so. They could be two unknown people. 
God can use the nobodies to confound the somebodies. That is usually his method. He chooses the most unlikely people to be his witnesses. But these two in the heart of Jerusalem witness to the Lord Jesus and his Father and warn the world before it's too late to turn back to him. We are told of that time that Jerusalem will still be trampled by the Gentiles. Many people believe that now that Jerusalem is back in Jewish hands, its troubles are over, but you know from recent months that is far from the truth. I'm afraid the worst days of Jerusalem are still ahead. Zechariah tells us that. There will come a time when a united nation's force of all the rest of the nations of the world will attack Jerusalem. And that is becoming so credible now that I can see how easily it will happen. America is going to stop supporting the Jews. Britain, I guess, already has. Europe is turning against Israel. And anti-Semitism is now taking the form of political anti-Israelism. And it's a serious situation. It's building up to the point where Israel will be on her own with backs against the wall. And then she will turn to her God. Because Israel is a secular a nation or as godless a nation as any other nation. Only about 10% go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. It's a shock to people who go to Israel who think everybody walks around with a Bible in their hand. It's not like that at all. When I had an audience with the president of Israel for three quarters of an hour in his residence as the result of a speech I'd given, um, he said to me sadly at the end, I'm an agnostic. I don't know whether there's a God or not. I said, how can you be in the land that has seen more miracles of God than any other? But he said, no, I remain an agnostic. It is a shock to people with a naive view of the Jews to think that they are godly people. They're not. There already have been a million and a half abortions in Israel since 1948. And it, they had a million and a half children killed in the Holocaust. And they've now killed the same number of their own. And it was saying that in public in Jerusalem that got me an audience with the president. He wanted to know more. Well, there will be two witnesses at the end in the streets of Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. That slipped in so that we know it's the Jerusalem on earth that we're talking about. It's not some new Jerusalem in heaven. This is old Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified and two prophetic witnesses. This is the first time there is a, a period mentioned of a specific time of the big trouble, 42 months and 1,260 days or a time, times, and half a time. Three and a half times, three and a half years. It's all the same figure. This is also the first mention of the beast. Again, we don't know who it is yet or what it is. It just suddenly mentions the beast. Clearly, these prophets are defining the time length of the troubles and also defining one person who will appear at the climax of the trouble. And what happens to them? They are killed in the streets of Jerusalem. Not much new to Jerusalem. Bloodshed has taken place all through the centuries in the streets of that city. But the last bloodshed in the city will be those two faithful witnesses. And their bodies are left lying in the street. Nobody buries them. Again, I guess all this will be on television because the Middle East is the heart of the news at the moment and I'm sure it will be then. And we shall see two bodies lying in the street on our TV screens. And then the most astonishing thing happens. Three days later, they stand up. They rise from the dead and before the very eyes of an astounded crowd, they ascend into heaven. 
In other words, what happened to their Lord and Master in that city is repeated with those final two witnesses. Could anything be more convincing to the world that God is in the message they were giving and that he is vindicating his servants as he vindicated Jesus by raising him on the third day and carrying him to heaven later. So these two witnesses to the truth not only give it verbally, they embody it in what happens to them. And Jerusalem receives this final message. In the city where Jesus was crucified, his two witnesses are killed, raised from the dead before everyone's sight. Jesus was not raised from the dead publicly. The world did not see it happen. But they will see this happen and see them ascend to heaven and they will be reminded straight away why that's what happened to Jesus in this very city. What a telling testimony. Now we move on to the third interlude. From the two groups and the two witnesses, we move on to the two beasts. Six seals are over, six trumpets are over. The last and worst series of disasters is about to happen. It will be the worst for the world and the toughest for the church. Chapter 12 begins in an extraordinary way with the statement, there was war in heaven. War in heaven? We've heard about wars and rumors of wars on earth, but this is the first time we hear of wars in heaven of all places. But there is a vision here. I'll begin with the vision. It is an extraordinary vision. And as I've told you, many artists are captured by the book of Revelation and try and uh, put it into pictures. And an artist in London did this picture for me. It is the picture of a naked, pregnant, heavily pregnant mother, clothed in sun, and of a multi-headed red dragon waiting for her to deliver her son or her child and he's waiting to devour that child, kill the child. That's the vision. I won't leave it on because I think it's a bit distracting. But who is it all about? And incidentally, she has a crown of 12 stars against the blue sky of heaven. Have you seen that anywhere, incidentally? It's the flag of the European Union, which is directly based on Revelation 12, but on a wrong identification of the woman. Now, who is this pregnant woman? We know who the dragon is, that ancient serpent, Satan, the devil. And he is waiting to destroy the child the woman bears as soon as it's born. Now you can imagine that uh, it is quite easy to think that the woman is Mary, Miriam, the mother of Jesus. And that is the Catholic interpretation of this passage, the Roman Catholic interpretation. And if you pick up a Roman Catholic commentary, on Revelation, one of you showed me that you had done recently, I think you'll find that it says this is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it's become the flag of the European Union because the Christian Democratic Party in Germany thought it would be great to have Mary protecting the European Union. And so the European flag is the blue sky with this woman's circlet of 12 stars. Those 12 stars do not represent 12 nations in Europe because there are now 15 in the European Union. And so they ought to do what they, you've done with your American flag and stuck extra stars in as you get hold of Hawaii and Alaska. But they, no, they haven't stuck any extra stars in and there's no intention because that is actually the crown of Mary, Queen of Heaven in Catholic teaching. After all, we know that as soon as Mary bore Jesus, Herod tried to kill her and sent, to kill him and sent soldiers to Bethlehem 
to slaughter every baby boy under two. And I guess this uh, mistake, as I believe it to be, is understandable. The stars, in fact, in this vision represent angels, not European nations. But the main reason for saying this is, why on earth, in the middle of describing the big trouble at the end of history, should we suddenly be told to go back to Bethlehem? It makes no sense at all, does it? But the Catholic interpretation gripped the whole church through the Middle Ages and became a very fixed understanding and has now popped, ag popped up again in the European Union flag. But I don't believe that's the truth. Let's ask, who is the baby then? Well, surely it is Jesus, is it? Well, if it's Jesus, it must be Mary, the woman. No, I don't believe the mother is Mary, nor do I believe the child in her womb is Jesus. And the reason it doesn't fit is this. It says that this woman, to preserve her life, has to flee to the wilderness for 1,260 days. Mary never had to do that. And 1,260 days, that is precisely the period God has revealed for the big trouble. So this woman is in the big trouble. She's bearing a baby in the big trouble. So that rules out not only the Catholic interpretation, but the Protestant interpretation. The Protestant reformers said, we don't accept this is Mary because of all the things that were said about Mary in the Middle Ages. They reacted against that. They said it can't be Mary. But the baby must still be Jesus because devil tried to destroy Jesus. And so they argued back the mother. They didn't want her to be Mary, so they said the mother represents the people of Israel who bore Jesus. But it still took the interpretation at thousands of years back into history in the middle of telling us about the end times. And so I don't believe that's right either. We are left with a third possibility which does fit. That the mother represents the church of Christ in the last days. And that the child she bears are the new converts that she will still be having. In other words, both the mother and the child are corporate figures representing more than one individual. Here we have a mother in the middle of the big trouble, still bearing babies, having to flee to the wilderness to survive for that last period. So here we have a picture of the church producing converts to the last, and the devil succeeds in destroying the baby, but only succeeds in transporting the baby straight to heaven. In other words, there will be many converts who will be martyred quickly after their conversion, but they will find themselves in heaven almost immediately. In fact, that's rather a nice idea, isn't it? Would you rather have been converted and gone straight to heaven? No more struggles? Straight there? Our problems arise because we have to stay here in a hostile world. There they are being comforted by God in heaven, the mother's children that the devil has destroyed. We also find now this war in heaven. If you go to Coventry Cathedral in, London, in England, the one I told you about, it's about 100 miles from London, on the inside you will see that tapestry of Jesus I told you about, but on the outside wall there is a remarkable sculpture. This cathedral has been modeled on the book of Revelation in so many different ways, quite unusual in that. But outside on the wall is a gigantic metal sculpture fixed to the wall. And above is the archangel Michael, or as we should say, Michael. The archangel Michael is victorious, and below him is the horrid figure of the devil being driven out of heaven. You see, the devil at the moment has access to heaven. 
He can go to and fro in the earth. He can visit heaven. He is the accuser of the brethren in heaven. Whenever a Christian sins, the devil loves to go and report it to God. He loves to go to heaven's court and say, another of your so-called saints has sinned. And he loves accusing the brothers. That is why you need an advocate in heaven to plead your cause. And John says in his letter, if any Christian sins, we have an advocate with the Father. The devil will be the counsel for the prosecution up there about you if you sin. But Jesus is your counsel for the defense. Isn't that a lovely thought? We have an advocate with the Father. Well, here it is from Revelation 12 and the archangel Michael. It doesn't take more than one archangel to deal with the devil. He is only an angel, a rebellious one, but that's all he is. He's not God. And he is thrown out of heaven and comes down to earth in frustration, in fury, because he now no longer has access to the place where he was first created in heaven. And that's when trouble really starts down on earth. Big trouble. Because we now have two beasts who appear. Two animal-like men. One is a political figure and the other a religious figure. One is a political dictator backed up by a religious leader for one world religion. This is where the world is heading and so many straws on the water point this way as you read your newspaper. This world is heading for one world government, believe me. It's heading therefore for one world dictator. When democracy breaks down, people plead with the dictator to take over and democracy will break down. There's an essential weakness in democratic government. Democracy is not God's idea of government. We are born to live in a kingdom under a king. And we respond best to a strong leader who is a good leader, who sacrifices for his people. Now I hear so much about democracy. I remember watching, um, what is the uh, film director's name who made the Ten Commandments? Cecil B. DeMille. And he comes on at the beginning of that film and talks about Moses and said, Moses was the man who brought us democracy. <laughs> and I thought, Cecil B. DeMille, have you ever read your Bible? And he made a speech about how Moses set his people free to be democratic. <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> we are destined to be people who live under kings. Now a king is a one single man government and he makes all the laws. In a kingdom there is no government, there is no parliament, there are no debates, no political parties, no votes, no elections. The king decides everything and the people accept that. Now how many of you would rather America was a kingdom than a democracy? Nobody? Do you know, I should be a politician. I could change the way you vote in two minutes. Give me two minutes. If I could find a king who had no interest in his own power, fame, or wealth, who had a heart for the poor and the sick, who wanted to see every poor person fed and every sick person healed and who would give his life for his subjects, if I could find a president like that, would you like to vote for him? Of course, put your hand up if you'd like to vote for him. See what I mean? Should have been a politician. But you see, that is what God made us for, to live under a good king. The reason we like democracy is very simple. It prevents us from living under a bad king. That's the only reason for it, because we can throw them out every four years if they don't turn out as we want them, and they usually don't. So Winston Churchill said democracy is the worst kind of government except all the others. And that is a typical Churchillian remark. You see, I already heard some of you saying, depends on the king.
But the history of royalty through the ages is that there are far more bad kings than good ones, even in the kingdom of Israel. That's why they looked forward to a good king, a king who would serve his people, who would lay down his life for his people. And Jesus came and they didn't recognize him. And when he died, there it was above his head, this is the king of the Jews. And they missed it. But he's coming back and giving them another chance. And he's coming back to bring the kingdom of God on earth. That's going to save us an awful lot of money, you know, spent on elections. Millions spent on getting a man for just four years. I just don't understand the wisdom of it. But he'll come for free <laughs> and be a king and rule his people wisely and well. And he will settle all the disputes between the nations and no one will grumble because he will do it with justice. And once you've established justice, you can have peace. You can't have peace without justice. Because anybody who still has a, a grievance, a feeling of injustice, will prevent you having peace. And all the conflicts in the world boil down to this sense of injustice on the part of somebody or other. But when disputes are settled properly by King Jesus, it will be accepted as fair by all parties concerned, and we shall have peace. Well, I've jumped ahead to tomorrow's subject, so let's jump back into these beasts. The final beast dictator will be the worst king ever. He will begin well by offering people peace and security, which is what they will really want by then, and they will vote for anyone who promises to give it to them. Most of the world's dictators began doing good things. And then power corrupted them. Hitler saved Germany from unemployment and impossibly high inflation. He built good roads and ordered a people's car for everybody to be able to get around. And he called it the people's car, the Volkswagen. And they're still on the roads. And we owe that to Hitler. But alas, power turned his head, as it turned so many rulers' heads. And he became dreadfully corrupt and even demonically inspired. And this will be the final world ruler. He will rule from the Middle East. We saw that when we studied Matthew 24. And he will set himself up as God and demand that there is no will higher than his own to which he is responsible. He is only responsible to his own determined will. That was Hitler's approach as well. By sheer determination of his self-will, he gained complete power over that people in Germany. This will happen on a world scale at the end. He is variously referred to in 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians as the man of lawlessness, meaning not that he's crazy, but that he doesn't acknowledge any law above his own will. A man who makes his own laws for everybody else. He's called the Antichrist. And I told you that Satan once offered this job to Jesus himself and said, serve me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world and you can have them, you can rule the world if you let me rule you. And Jesus did not say, they're not yours to offer because in fact God had given the kingdoms of this world to Satan. He is the God of this world, the prince of this world. In fact, the devil can offer you anything you want in this world. Because the world is his kingdom. He can offer you fame, power, whatever, pleasure, whatever you really want, the devil can offer to you. But it has a price tag. And the price tag is that you become his slave. That's all. And he offered Jesus the whole world and said, it's yours if I rule you. And Jesus, thank God, turned him down. Had he not turned him down, we would be talking tonight about Jesus, Antichrist. But he was called to be Jesus Christ, the Savior. And he knew that the devil's offer, though it was a tremendous offer, he'd come to get the world back for his father. And it was a subtle pressure 
don't believe that Jesus' temptations were easy to face. It was a battle. But he turned it down and became the Christ for us. But one day a man will accept the devil's offer. He is the world. I rule you, you rule the world. And he will accept the offer. And will demand worship, blasphemous worship, for those three and a half years. He is a man who will have a coalition of other rulers. He will rule the world through a coalition of others. That's why he has ten horns and seven heads, one of which is fatally wounded and miraculously restored to life. We haven't time to go into all the details because there is a second beast we must remember, and he is a religious dictator who will achieve what many are already working for, one world religion. You know, the first to work publicly for that in America was John Foster Dulles. And he arranged gatherings, conventions of all the religions of the world. He had a dream of one world religion. We are nearer to that dream being fulfilled now than we've been for a long time. Religious syncretism is on the march. The idea that all religions are the same underneath and worship the same God is taking hold of millions of minds. Preparing the way you can see the scenario developing. There will be one world religion supporting this one world state under one world dictator. And the false prophet will perform signs and wonders, miracles which will be seen as supernatural, but it will be Satan's power behind it, not God's. And that is why God's people are told to be very cautious and not be deceived by supernatural events in the last days. Oh, how, how much we need protection of God when such things begin to happen, when the world around us is all going the wrong way and having miracles performed by the religious beast. What's going to happen to people under all that? Well, I just mentioned one thing because it brings it down to earth. That beast will have a number, 666. Don't ask me what it means. Nobody knows at this stage. Nobody can know. But just as there are foreshadowings of the Antichrist and of the false prophet, there have been foreshadowings of 666. There are cars and motorbikes running around with that number on their number plate. People proud to associate with it become quite a common knowledge now that 666 is the final rebellion against God and rebellious people are already using the number. But even in the New Testament days, if you turn Nero Caesar into figures, letter by figure, you'll find his number was 666. And you'll probably find a number of the other dictators through history have also had names that can be converted into that number. But the final last one, we do not know. What we do know is that that figure will be laser beamed or implanted chip, I don't know, either onto the back of our hand or onto our forehead. And the law will be promulgated that everyone who buys and sells must have this number. Money will be finished with, cash will go. Everything bought and sold will be by number. And when you reach the checkout at the supermarket, instead of pulling out your plastic card, you will simply pass your hand, or, or the girl will simply pass the whatever it is over your forehead, and it's out of your bank account. Now, you know, 40 years ago, people laughed at this idea of buying and selling with a number on the back of your hand or on your forehead. Nobody laughs today. It's already on the cards. It's being uh, spoken of already. They were discussing in China not long since the idea of putting a number on the back of a baby's heel as soon as it was born. And that number tattooed into the heel of the baby would be its insurance number, its driving license number, its mortgage number. It would be one number that would tie it for life into the records of the whole system. So this kind of thing is now almost here. And there it was in Revelation 2,000 years ago. 
God knew it was coming. Well now, many Christian families will be under terrific pressure. If you've got children at that time, and they're desperate for food, and you know that the only way you can get it from the shops is that, what a temptation that will be. That is why the woman flees to the wilderness. She must get out into the country somewhere where she can scratch a bit of food in some way. But she will survive. God will provide for her. But not through the shops. Now all that gives us a picture of where the Lord's people will be and what pressures they will be under. But chapter 14 lifts our spirits. It's full of angels. There are three at first, then two, and then seven. What does that add up to? Twelve. There's that figure again. But let's see what chapter 14 tells us about what the angels are doing at this very time. The three angels are renouncing things to the whole world. But at this point we have a little foretaste of the future. We see 144,000 in heaven. Again a round number, 12 by 12 by 1,000. And many people have got confused because they think it's the same 144,000 as in chapter 7. But they were Jews. These are Christians. They are martyrs up in heaven. And they are crying out to God. How much longer will you be before you act to vindicate your people? Do you know that's often a prayer that we pray? How long, Lord, do we have to wait for an answer? How long before you do something about this situation? How long? And it's a final prayer of the martyrs in glory. Now look at the three angels. The first angel goes out flying through mid-heaven with the eternal gospel that could save every human being on earth. This angel is saying the good news is still available. You don't need to face God's wrath. You can be saved. You can be reconciled. The gospel is still available and will still be available to the last moment. A friend of mine was uh, a Royal Air Force pilot during the war and his particular task was to go out over the Atlantic and search for submarines that were on the surface recharging their batteries as they have to do every few hours. That's their most dangerous time. And he had this plane and he would fly around the Atlantic and he would spot a submarine and he would dive down on it straight away before it could submerge and drop bombs on it. And he successfully destroyed a submarine. And as he was flying back to base in England, he was a Christian, he was a New Zealander, called Murray Kendon. And he thought, you know, why should this marvelous invention of flight be being used to destroy life? And he said to God at that time, by your grace, I will start an air force after this war is over to spread the gospel and the good news of Jesus. But he said, give me a verse from Scripture to confirm that this idea is from you. And he opened his Bible at Revelation 14, and I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven with the eternal gospel for every creature on earth. And Murray Kendon saved up and bought a little twin-engine Miles Gemini aircraft. And the first plane I ever flew in was that plane. <laughs> And Murray Kendon gave me my first flight in it and told me of his dream. And he'd already got a pilot and a navigator. Stuart King was the navigator. I'm trying to think of the name of the pilot, but dear me, I'm an old man and I forget names so quickly. I'm still in touch with them after all these years. They're all still alive. And I flew in their little plane in 1946. And this became known as the Missionary Aviation Fellowship. MAF, now flying missionaries around the world. How many of you have heard of the MAF? Look at it. And it started with that New Zealander flying back from bombing a submarine. I visited him last time I was in New Zealand. And Murray Kendon, no, uh, Jack, 
Jack was the pilot, and I rang him last Christmas. He just walked away from an air crash. <laughs> and uh, actually, the Mars Gemini crashed in Africa. He walked away from that. I said, you're still walking away from air crashes then? But that man has been serving the Lord, flying God's servants around. And I've flown in MAF planes all around. And it was this verse that inspired him to follow through with that dream. The second angel says, Babylon is fallen. What's all that about? That's the first time we've heard the name Babylon in the book of Revelation. And what do you mean fallen? Well, tomorrow morning we'll look at Babylon. It's a whole new incident that we need to look at separately. And the second angel is promising that the enemies of God are finished. And the third angel gives a warning to believers. And this is my proof that believers are still on earth at this time. I want to spend just one session, perhaps the session after lunch tomorrow, telling you why I believe that it is a dangerous, false prophecy that America is infected with and is spreading over the whole world through its many missionaries, that Christians will escape before the big trouble begins. I want to show you why I cannot believe that is biblical and true. Because there are so many Americans who will hear this series and hear my voice, and I want to tell them the truth, not because I enjoy telling people they're in for bad times, but because I believe with all my heart that God has told us all this for a purpose. And the third angel says clearly, this is a call to the saints to endure and to keep the commandments of God and to remain faithful to Jesus. And it's right there in the middle of the big trouble. It's a call to us. And what is that this, where he says this is a call to the saints that you're... The this is an extraordinary little vision where John sees hell for the first time and sees the smoke of the torture and the torment of those in hell rising forever and ever, the smoke from the fire. And immediately after the vision of hell, the angel says this is a call to the saints to endure, to see it through. It's a warning. It's a last warning in a sense to the people of God. Hang on, hold in there. It's soon going to be over. Two more angels appear after the three, and they are followed by the seven who come with the seven bowls of the plagues to pour out as the climax of the big trouble. Twelve angels all together in this single chapter. We're reminded of Jesus who said it's the angels who will deal with all the tares in the world. We're not to be into tear pulling. So let's close. The coming of Christ is very near now. Very near. And so in this same chapter, this final call to believers comes. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. We've already come across this concept of being dressed, ready for the bridegroom to come. The dress of the righteous deeds of the saints, the fine linen, represents our good living. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus also said, be ready and dressed for my coming. And here it is again. It's the same Jesus who spoke in the Gospel of Luke. He's now speaking in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Those who are awake and ready will not be surprised. He will only come like a thief to those who are not ready. For as Jesus said in one of his parables, if the master of the household had known when the thief was coming in the night, he would have stayed awake and been ready for him. Christians will not be caught out 
Jesus is not coming like a thief to Christians, like a, a burglar secretly hiding in the shadows. He will come when Christians expect him because they are sober and awake and watching and praying. But to the world he will come like a thief to take away so much from them, to rob them of what they have valued. But those who are ready and dressed for the occasion will welcome him gladly. Do come tomorrow. Tomorrow morning we look at Babylon, that final city opposed to God. First session tomorrow afternoon I want to deal with the question, why are you so sure, David, that Christians will be in the big tribulation when so many preachers around the world are telling us we won't be? And then later in the afternoon I hope to begin looking at the millennium, but in the evening I hope to get on to the new heaven and the new earth. And dear me, I wish we had five days, but uh, my body doesn't. My body says you've had enough, <laughs> but my spirit says let's go on to the end. Let's pray. Father, I have something to ask you and I really mean it. If I've said anything that is not your truth, will you please blot it out from the memory of those who heard it before it does any damage? But if I've been speaking what you wanted me to say and what is the truth for you a truth, I pray that your Holy Spirit will confirm it through Scripture so that it becomes not my teaching but your word to my brothers and sisters here. And when they know with conviction and clarity what you are telling us, may they be bold enough to share it with others before the day comes when no, the night comes when no man can work and the opportunity of salvation is gone. So Lord, receive what I've been saying and select from it those things that you want us most to remember until they become part of our character and daily life. Getting ready for the big day when you send our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ back to this sad, sick old world to clean it up in your name and for your sake. Oh, Holy Father, hear our prayer. Amen.